Give it a few minutes. Ooh, people are starting to turn up, are they? I hope so. <laughs> Let's give this a quick minute to, to initialize. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think we've got viewers. I can't actually tell from my screen. I'm going to start talking anyway. Oh, there we go. We've got 59. The number's going up. We've got a lot of participants. Excellent. Hey, everyone. Welcome. It's Cycle Touring Festival 2023. This is like, I've lost count, maybe the 800th talk of the week, maybe the fifth or sixth. Uh, who knows about numbers anymore? Um, it's been a great festival so far, and tonight is going to be absolutely no different. We've got a real treat in store for you. Um, before I get into any of that and introduce John, uh, tonight's speaker, um, need to do a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Um, you've heard this in every other talk, but I'm going to big it up again anyway. Uh, the Cycling Touring Festival is free, but it's not free for the people who run the Cycle Touring Festival. So if you're able to donate, there will be a link that I will put in the chat um, a few times over the talk. Uh, there's a suggested donation of five pounds per household per talk or 20 pounds for the whole festival. Um, it's an absolute bargain and it allows uh, Laura to pay for all of the um, stuff that, that keeps it running, all the websites and Zooms and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, she drives around in a really expensive car as well. No, um, no, it's, <laughs> it all goes on the festival. It all goes to a, to a good cause. Um, there, ooh, where are we? I might have posted the wrong intro in, in the chat, but never mind. Um, tonight's talk is titled uh, Cycling the Mjölkvegen Route in Norway, which is uh, a 250 kilometer journey by John Hausego. Um, ooh, actually, before I go in, into John, just a wee point about questions for John. If you want to give John any questions at the end, there'll be a bit of a Q&A session at the end. There is a Q&A function somewhere in your Zoom app where it's down there if you're on a desktop. I think it's up there somewhere if you're on a mobile device. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A box rather than in the chat, because lots of people kind of chat away and it's hard to keep track of all the questions in the chat box. Uh, if in the Q&A box, they'll be there and we can sort of choose those out and I'll, and I'll post those to John at the end. Um, okay, what can I say about John Hausego? Well, I've never met John before until literally 15 minutes ago, but <laughs> I could tell by looking at his, um, his blog, cycletour.co.uk, excellent URL. Um, we've got a lot in common because most of his tours are in like northern Europe. So it's all Iceland and Sweden and Norway and the Netherlands and all of the places that you think of as being cold and windy, but are actually really amazing, beautiful places to go. And he is going to tell you about a gravel route uh, in like, the middle of Norway. So? Yeah, so sort of, yeah, middle south, middle of South Norway. I, I'd describe places in Norway yeah. anyway. It's long. Uh, I'll, I'll anyway, show you. called the Bjorkvegen. That's all I'm going to tell you about it, John. Take it away. Okay, okay, you're right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, great to be part of this festival. Uh, and um, I'll see if I can share my screen and get everything up. Okay, so here we go. Let's go into that and slideshow. And right, I hope, oh no, that's not right. You wanna see that one. Right, can everybody see that screen? Cycling the Mulkvagen, okay. <laughs> And you can see by that first slide, it's a cracker of a route. OK, so I'm basically going to take you through um, the Milkwagen, uh basically means, oops, I've hit two things together, the Milky Way in Norwegian. It's the road where the fresh milk from the summer mountain farms is taken down to the dairies in the valley. It's 132 mile ish, depending on sort of which way you go, or a uh, high level route. And I do say it's a high level route from Vinstra in the north and to go in the south and it's a route that we i must admit we did back in 2015 but it's such a, a lovely route i just wanted to uh, uh pass it on to you basically here's the actual uh elevation don't look too scary because obviously it's not quite at that right scale but you'll see down the bottom here if i can find the mouse and there we go uh we go up to one plateau here, second plateau over a big mountain, which goes up to 412, oh, yeah, 4,255 uh, feet. And then there's a third plateau down to Gaul. OK, it's approximately, it's quite a bit of ascent and descent, as you can see, uh, 11 and a half uh, ascent and about 11 and a half descent. 
Um, most of the routes on are gravel roads and tracks that serve the high pastures. There's very little traffic on, on these roads. And the Milkwagen has been voted one of Norway's finest cycling tours. And it forms part of cycle route uh, five. Now, I was attracted to this route basically because of the gravel part of it. I'm getting on a bit now. We've done sort of 25 odd years of uh, cycle touring as our main uh, sort of holiday in the summer. And I get a bit fed up with fighting with traffic. So I love now getting onto gravel road, but also take me out into wilderness areas. Um, there is a railway station at both ends, so you could get to it e easily, um, you know, from Oslo. Uh, let's see where it actually is. Here we go. This is southern Norway. There's Oslo down here, and we've got Bergen over there, and it's this black line coming down through there. Finster at the top and gold down the bottom. A little bit more detail. Uh, I'd say that you... This is the route comes through over one uh, sort of a plateau area, drops down another plateau area along the Jotunheim Wegen. Uh, and at this point, there is a, you can either go the way that we went, which is down here, or there's an alternative which takes you uh, from Bigden along this big lake on a ferry. And then you pick up Route 5 and it comes around through here. And then we come over the, the Valdres area here and the Stolzvida. You'll see that there's these green um, sort of markers. That's where there is accommodation along the route. There are some shops and whatever. So there aren't that many shops, I should say. So you need to stock up at um, Finstra here, uh, Beta Stolen. Uh, there is one over there. And there's one down at Vasset and another one down here at Rufus. Or there's actually one at Vang down there and obviously there's something at goal uh the other thing too is there are quite a few uh hotels and what called felstus uh sort of mountain uh well felstu basically means mountain living room which is just whatever but it's it's basically a mount like a mountain hut that's really a hotel um but you can get lunches you can get meals in there um if you're camping which is what we did well we most of the time um, you can get water off the mountain streams, but you need to be aware that the fowls are grazed by sheep and cattle. So if you want it to be safe, you need to boil it and possibly filter it. But if you go into the hotel to fell stores, they will happily fill your water bottles for you. The weather, if anybody's been to Norway, they will probably know the, it can rain in Norway. It can come down in stair rods, or you can have sun, morning hot sun, or you could have wind, or you can have a mixture of two. It's a, bit, a little bit like Scotland, you know, in some respects. And also because it's a high level route, um, when you're on the plateaus, you're at two and a half to three and a half, um, a thousand feet above the sea level. So it's going to be colder than the valleys. So therefore you need to take appropriate rain gear and warm clothes. Okay, I'm just going to take you through the route with a whole lot of slides um, from our little trip. We basically flew uh, to Oslo to Gardermoen Airport and caught train, nice train up to Finstra. Uh, I was going to do this talk and talk about you know, cycling generally in Norway, but it just isn't the time, but I'll try and put in one or two things. Um, if you're going to use the trains, uh, you need to book them. There's only certain places on trains. Um, and I think if it's still the same, uh, you have to pay something like the child's fare or half uh, the adult fare for your bikes, which is a little bit, but that's how it goes. Um, we got up to Vinstra and um, the campsite no longer existed. <laughs> um, it was advertised, but it had closed that year, if I remember rightly. So we actually headed north, uh, not far, only a few miles up to a place called, I think it's pronounced Cam Cam, um, where there was a campsite. And uh, it was actually for, uh, quite good, really, because being teachers, we'd literally finished term. We got there and we felt we just needed a couple of days, which we actually did have there, which gave us an opportunity to look round. And what was really interesting is at this particular point um, in the Second World War, um, our uh, lads from, I think, it's, yeah, the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry and the Gain Howards put up a, um, a sort of rear guard action to try and prevent the uh, uh, invasion by the Germans along with the Norwegians. Um, 
And uh, so that's quite interesting. This is actually um, their war memorial there. And if you're really interested, there's a what they call the Kriegsmeiner Sammling Museum. It's a museum uh, and it tells you all about that and also about the uh, Norwegian resistance. Anyway, let's get on to the cycling. Uh, from Quam, we came up to Vinstra on the 2614. As you can say, the weather's improved uh, dramatically. I've put down on the left hand side here a little bit out of the elevation so you can see roughly where we are. And we were in for a treat because we <laughs> it was steep and you will see it. Um, I can't remember what exactly the inclination is, but it's probably somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, I think. I don't know. But if you look at Frank's cycling style, she has this wonderful cycling style of going up hills on their hard work. She tacks. And you can see she's a one bit of attack, whatever. She's amazing. She, um, unfortunately, she's not here tonight. Um, but um, you know, she, she, she can just. I don't know how she does it. I can't go that slow. I would fall off. But uh, she's amazing. She keep just keeps going. Um, as I say, it was a really hot day, and we're several miles. Up. I've got had loads of slides. I can only pick out so many. And we were great to get up to here. It's the Volstammer. Uh, and it's a lake and it was great to have a cool down you know and whatever um at that point if you look at the elevation on the side here uh we left the tarmac road that's there aren't that many bits of tarmac uh you're soon onto gravel and we were heading for fifa here and the road from there is that is actually a gravel road it looks like a tarmac road but that's actually gravel the um uh, Norwegians are very good at their gravel roads, and I was quite impressed uh, with them, uh, but it was still st steep. But you can see we, we've come up now and we're starting to get some great views. Um, we stopped that night. We were going to camp, um, but when we got to the um, uh, hotel up there, we looked around. Like it was supposed to be a campsite, but it didn't seem to be obvious. And anyway, we were both pretty knackered. It was getting quite late. So I actually asked if we could stay in one of their cabins, uh, which we did for the night. Now, the FIFA Fell Hotel is actually very interesting. It has an interesting uh, history. It was used by Robert Falcon Scott to test his equipment for the Terra Nova expedition, uh, you know, for the 1910-1913 expedition. Um, and that road that we came up used to be really a bumpy gravel road, and he used his um, motorized sledge to pull 100 of the locals up, just as a bit of fun. Um, and then, uh, because this was midwinter, they then tested them out in the lake, which you can just see behind. The other interesting thing is that it was requisitioned by the Germans during the Second World War, and the manager there, or the owner, I think, um, he uh, set up a Mylorg uh, resistance um, group right under their noses. And while he was entertaining them in here, his workers were out, you know, taking, uh, you know, parachute drops for supplies and arms and things right under their noses. It's quite interesting. Anyway, from there, uh, the next day, we're, we're heading for um, Hatals. Uh, well, when I say that, we actually tend to ride and when we get to we've had enough we stop and uh so we don't always plan things out we just go for it anyway we're we're heading down and it was nice after that big climb up to to be heading down um the road itself uh, most of the traffic is agricultural as you see these great big bales of hay that come down from the upland pastures um it is uh an, a toll road um so car traffic has to pay a toll to go through so there's very limited traffic on it which is really nice this is us coming uh, down to that little hamlet here of uh Lundstrin. i think that's how you pronounce it and you can start to see these um hay fields and uh, uh, there's a little dairy just in there where frank is we did meet some other tourists um this was a nice dutch couple that we met there um we went one or two uh, other tourists, another guy from uh, yeah Holland, and an, 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 another English guy who uh, uh, was quite interesting. But most of the other people that were riding it were just sort of mountain bikers, obviously just out for a day's ride because you can do the ride in you know sort of several different days. Um, from there, it's up, <laughs> and 
there's the gravel road. I say it's not bad. This is, you know, uh, where it, uh, it starts to really go up and it goes up. <laughs> um, so it's fairly steep. But I was just talking to, to Laura. Uh, we had some friends, Stan and Dama, who at the time lived in Gaul. And they'd done this route um, with their, I think he was two or three year old child in one of those um, kiddie um, trailers. Um, so, you know, it's possible to do it. Um, right, going on. Oh, yeah, that day, there's <laughs> quite a lot of, of that. That's me looking back at Frank, who's uh, a little bit behind. Uh, but the views, absolutely brilliant. Uh, we were very lucky with the weather generally. And uh, as you go up, it started the you know to get less steep, and you're starting to be out in this sort of scrubby um, area. You've, you've you know, left the big trees behind now, and that's our camp for the night. Um, I was explaining you know about some of the things in um, Norway. One of the nice things about Norway is there is a thing called Almansritten, which basically means it's like the or any man's right to camp just one or two nights i think it is um anywhere as long as it's not calculated ground fenced in land uh or i think 150 meters from uh, a um a place of habitation so you, you know, this is probably what 50 yards off the road found a little spot um and we're there for the night next day uh and you can see from the elevation uh we're up at or we were up the top there, uh, Hatals. I'm at a nice downhill section with a little bit of road in between. A little bit more of an overcast day, um, but we actually had a bit, we stopped about halfway down and had, went for a walk in the forest. We tend to do that because Frank's into um, flora and fauna you know, and uh, wildflowers and stuff. And uh, whoops, that's suddenly gone through. Beg your pardon. Um, so there's loads of wild flowers, as you can see. I think that's uh, field gentian. I'm not sure about the other one. And we were down now to uh, Dalsetta. Unfortunately, I haven't got a photograph of it, um, but there is a nice hotel down there, and they had a brilliant lunch, one of these sort of buffet lunches. So we took advantage of that before heading our way down to Olstapham. Uh, that's the guy. I can't remember his name just offhand. He was an English guy we met. Who actually was working for a, uh, as a forester, and he'd had a forestry accent uh, on, uh, I think, a uh, part of a branch fell on his knee or something, and he'd had some surgery on it. And it was actually his consultant who thought it was a good idea that he should take up cycling to um, rehabilitate the knee. So he was out uh, doing uh, the milk wagon, and oh, not doing too well with my mouse here. Sorry about that. Uh, the Dutchman, which we met halfway down um, to that, uh, he told us about this nice camping spot by the lake there. And you can just see that's our tent and the other guy's tent. And we had a lovely night, a lovely evening. Uh, beautiful spot, absolutely beautiful spot. Next day, as you can see from the elevation, uh, initially going around the, the last bit of the lake it's nice and flat but then we hit the hills again um and this one it's quite funny actually because we left him um uh, he was still packing up his tent so the guy sorry i can't remember his name and uh we headed on uh, and about halfway up he actually met us and we'd stopped and he says everything all right so i said yeah we're just taking a rest you know <laughs> or whatever i think he was more of a and straight up the hills you know whatever but uh, as you can see, we're into this birch scrub. Still a lovely surface road. Um, somebody's going to ask about tyres. Uh, we're on 42s. Um, and I think you could do this bit, you know, certainly on anything a bit, you know, a bit narrower, you know, or whatever. Uh, it wouldn't hurt, hurt at all. Oh, I'm going too quick on this. You've got to stop for lunch. You've got to have brews. We do quite a lot of them. And whatever, this is Frank under actually the shade of a tree there um, because it was funny when you were cycling the wind was a bit keen but if you stop still the wind uh, sorry the sun was a bit hot so we're finding out a little bit of um, shade uh, from there continued on up again a little bit as you can see it's starting to uh, to lose the trees 
And then we ended up at this place called Wesselfeld. And the uh, views up there were tremendous, absolutely lovely. Um, that's one of the little farms up there. And you're always reminded about the milk route, you know, as you go along. There's either churns on the side of the road or, you know, there's something. And I say that, that little hut's are lovely. Um, being sort of people that used to do a bit of mountaineering, we often stop and, you know, go up one or two of the mountains. And we went up this mountain behind Vesterfell called uh, Folkfangara, Felliet. And you're probably wondering what that structure is on the top there. It's not a shelter. It's actually a falcon trap. Uh, apparently, back in the day, you know, uh, they used to trap falcons. And I think these men ended up in, you know, the, uh, the Middle East or something. Uh, but they don't do it now. That's all totally banned. OK, and that's the, the view from the top. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, PowerPoint, you can't do a 360. Um, but actually on our site, uh, there's a 360 I've done there and it's, oh, absolutely brilliant. Lovely, open, and the mountains behind, beautiful. And as I say, Frank's into, um, you know, that's, these are all her pictures of um, the, the wild uh, flowers. Uh, that's red alpine catchfly, uh, whatever, that's on the top of the mountain. And that's our camp for the night at uh, Vessel uh, Fell. Uh, again, just not far off the road. Um, and the ubiquitous cooking of uh, dehydrated pasta. Um, because as I said, you had to carry most of your food with you, so it was all dehydrated. And we always rev our, our cheesy pasta up with a bit of salami just to make it a little bit more uh, interesting. Um, we had some woolly visitors because obviously the fowls are grazed, and um, this was a little bit early on in the evening, uh, but in the middle of the night when it was dark, um, suddenly the tent fell in, um, and Six sort of collapsed in on us, and there was a lot of meh, meh, you know, what, two of the sheep had decided that our tent was a mound and had jumped on top of it. Fortunately, you know, it was our uh, feet end of the tent, um, and it didn't break any poles. But I found out in the morning when I examined the tent, they'd put a couple of slight rips in the fly sheet. But uh, fortunately, we had some tape and we taped them up. But uh, that's one of the disadvantages of um, wild camping. Uh, in those sort of terrain. Uh, the next day, we, as you can see from the elevation here, am I doing for time? That's all right. Um, we're going from Vesafel uh, on the side here, um, and then we do it up at, uh, and over a sort of a, a hilly bit. Uh, it's called Boho, but that's the actual mountain. You don't go actually over that mountain. And then we're going along to uh, Vinstra. And you can see down there, there's, there's uh, one car coming through, we must have seen about two or three cars, you know, in the time. So it's not that much traffic because, as I say, it's a, it's a toll road. Um, so not many people come through on that one. Uh, this is up a little bit further. You can see that's quite nice terrain there. Uh, you know, it's not too, too hilly. And so sort of coming back down a bit from Boho, I don't know how you pronounce it. Apologies to any Norwegians who might be watching. My Norwegian pronunciation is possibly terrible. Um, but cracking views of these lakes, absolutely lovely. And if you're really lucky, you might see some of the reindeer herds uh, that are about. And this was one that just came across the path right in front of me. They uh, obviously couldn't see me. There was a little bluff to my left and I just stopped and they came across. And uh, unfortunately, another car did come up and uh, I was spooked and they ran off to my left. But uh, they're about, they're supposed to be elk as well. Never did actually see um, elk around this part, but uh, that's how it goes. Um, this is a little hamlet of uh, lice stolen. Um, you'll see a lot of these. These are little, um, uh, how shall I say, uh, things where they used to put churns. Um, so the milk churns used to go on these platforms and then the guy in the map, you know, the horse and cart come along, pick it up. Um, interesting that the name stolen. Uh, I wondered what that was. I was sort of trying to find out in, in Norwegian, uh, looking on the uh, translators, and it's a. It came out as 
uh, a chair and something else but actually i found out it means dairy farm so a stolen is a dairy farm so there's there's loads of um villages along the way there's most are stolen hugger stolen fell stolen beads are stolen they're also stolen and yep there's the cows <laughs> and you can start to see on this jotunheim uh vegan bit here um you can see the mountain uh with all the snow on the top as you can see frank's got her waterproof uh on and her hat that's not because it was raining well hardly, i don't think we saw any rain apart from one night um but it was cold because you're up at that high level and we ended up here we were going to camp um but i was saying about you can camp you know along the route it's whether you can find somewhere suitable and we kept looking at that particular point it was very rocky you know and um, there's bits that were boggy and that's the problem with um you know uh, trying to find somewhere and then frank spotted this sign that said hogsetter felstour 3.4 uh, kilometers and we thought oh let's go along uh, and see if they've got any space if not we can still camp and that's the advantage of having the tent with us and i remember we got up the door uh this lady came out and she said oh you, you wanted somewhere to sleep yeah be great well you know i said well plenty of room <laughs> and um we had a, a a nice room that's our room the bed's actually behind us and you'll notice it's got a little kitchenette there that's quite um often you, know, you see you see that so you can if you want to have meals in or you can cook your own meals uh we elected to have the whole package which included you know, your bed for the night your um, evening meal your breakfast which is a nice breakfast and they do a packed lunch and they'll fill your thermos up for you and uh, the evening meal was absolutely brilliant it was uh, elk stew fresh vegetables and roast potatoes and whatever and it was absolutely yum yummy mind you anything probably is really yummy after dehydrated uh, uh, <laughs> pasta but there you go and it's you know you know typical Norwegian with the skis and whatever lovely place and I say two ladies that run it really really friendly really lovely pack lunch uh that was uh bread rolls if I remember I think you made them up from the breakfast and then she gave you some brownies and a piece of fruit I think and then this was an absolute cracking day as you can see hardly a cloud in the sky lovely gravel road no traffic and um the only thing it was lovely and sunny but as you see frank's got her waterproof on again it was a bitter wind and unfortunately it was uh, a westerly and we were cycling right into it uh but as i say a lovely route a little, little bit up up and down but you've got the lake there and superb um wilderness that's where you are you're, you're sort of in the wilderness it's lovely flowers and uh the lake and mountains what more can you ask for absolutely lovely and as i said a little bit of in interval training uh, there's one or two little uh up any downy bits but no serious climbs on that day uh, you know really and loads of, of these little as i say uh farming uh hamlets this one's fast cap and that um big mountain you can see in the background is uh bitty horn um it sort of dominates the, the area there and then you come to this i think it's one of the nicest views in some way so it's apart from on um, the uh, island there's some cracking views there um but this one these are the jotunheim mountains um the jotunheim mountains are where the the two highest mountains in Norway are Galdhoppergen and Glittertind and this sort of brought me back to 1985 when I climbed Galdhoppergen uh then with a bunch of kids um uh, we, that was a DOV thing we brought them up and they did their DOV expeditions and then as part of the training we took them up uh Galdhoppergen um and it is beautiful now you notice where the uh um, the snow is there one thing I haven't told you is that officially uh, the Jotunheim Vegan is open from I think it's the 20th of June 
to something like um, September, October, I can't exact date in there, basically because, um, you know, uh, and it's with a lot of uh, mountain passes in Norway because of the, the snow. Uh, so if you're going to come and do it, you've got to do it in that, that sort of window, really. And <laughs> this is our, uh, these are not uh, feral goats. These are actually um, goats from the farm, but they obviously just let them uh, roam around. And they were so inquisitive. Um, one of them nearly pushed me off the bike. He was pushing up my pannier and whatever. And Frank was having problems. You can see one of them trying to chew her uh, bar bag there, but they're really quite cute. And that's just looking back down the route we've uh, uh, come from. Uh, the uh, Fels tour is somewhere over the back here and we've come right the way along uh, this route and we're coming around and uh, there's always one last sting in the tail you know with the, the climb up to uh, the 51 from the uh, from the Jotunheim Wegen. so we're coming up to uh, we've come along if you look at the elevation here up to Big Den how are we doing for time it's not too bad and we're now going to hit the 51 and this is the 51. Uh, Big Din is down there. And that's where you would go off on that variant that I talked about earlier. And uh, there are one or two uh, interesting birds about. That's a crane that was by the side of the 51. And then we have this wonderful downhill, which is down, as you can see, on the elevation here, down here, all the way down into Peter Stollen. 51. Summer can be a little bit busy, so but if I remember halfway down, it's about halfway down, or probably no, a third of the way down. Um, there's a cycle path that you can go on to. Now, Peter Stollen is a as you can see, a ski area in the winter. Uh, don't be surprised if you uh, have to share the cycle paths with cross country skiers on roller skis, uh, it's not unusual at all. Uh, I've come across it before in Norway. Uh, uh, what must have been a training group come flying past me um, uh, once. Uh, I say we actually spent uh, a, a couple of days because Frank's back wasn't too good at the time, um, just like, you know, resting and uh, stocking up the food. And then we're off again. And this is where we were going up the Slessers Fell yet. And if you look at the, the little, um, well, sorry, beg your pardon, clicking the wrong button again. Um, that first bit on the uh, left here on the elevation, you can see there's a little bit of uh, red. We were back on road. Um, wasn't too bad. A little bit of a, a lumpy bit in it. Uh, beautiful flowers again. Lovely harebells. Lovely flowers in there. And this this is Rod Dalen. Uh, you head down there, down this road, and you go along here, and you. you there's a route then up here, and uh, the Sletters Valiat is somewhere up about here. <laughs> so there's a bit of climbing on the next bit. This is us part way up. Again, lovely views across to the Ottenheim Mountains. Uh, and this is our route up. And uh, as you can see, we're going up across here. And um, you can probably just see where my red marker is. There was this little, you know, I thought it was, was it a mountain hut or whatever. When we got to it, it's, oh, sorry. Uh, it's a cafe, um, and uh, the two, uh, well, the two, the farmers, uh, so husband and wife, uh, they have these lovely um, cattle, uh, which they milk, and they produce cheese, and this is a cheese cooker where they uh, make uh, brunost, if that's how you pronounce it, which is basically brown cheese, and they boil it down, and if you see it in the shops, it looks a bit like fudge but it doesn't taste like fudge it's cheese you know that. and they make this stuff called kakako it's a sort of pancake uh, made from barley flour and uh, sour cream and uh, they serve that with coffee and then they put strawberry jam and sort of stuff that's a bit like yogurt on it really quite yummy really quite yummy um one of the cows took a liking to frank's uh, panniers uh, started chewing that and even started chewing our brook saddle, which <laughs> chase it off. Uh, from there, uh, we're on to, oh dear, that's right, it's my mouse. I keep click, click, clicking when I shouldn't do. Sorry. Um, on the elevation, you can see to the side there, uh, it is a fairly steep climb up there. And it's just a case of 
you know take your time we're really sort of you know you know we take a time you know we'll, we'll go up and say well aim for that little corner and we'll just have a little rest and then we'll go up you know we don't make a big meal of it but it's well worth it and say the views across uh Jotunheim and all the way around I think I can't show all the way around um absolutely brilliant and that's us getting near the top and um when we got to the top uh ready to go down the other side as you see there's a bit of a car park a few more cars on that bit um uh but not that many as you see frank's putting some uh, uh, uh warmer clothes on waterproof because what you can't see on to the left that we could see is this <laughs> that's what it was started to look like and uh, we thought oh, we could well be in for a wetting here lovely ride down the only problem is because it's gravel you just have to be a bit careful on the hairpins and whatever uh with loose gravel and we've got magura brakes but you still had to sort of stop part of the way down just stretch your, your fingers out and just you know before you carried on and basically where, where we were uh, heading down to uh, is Vang, which is here. So the route sort of takes you down through um, to, uh, there's the E6, uh, E16, which goes down through there to Vang. You can actually go this way to Rifus, and I'll explain about that as a variant a little bit later. As you get down, you're into, you know, sort of more normal territory, lovely waterfall here. Uh, Rinsner, and you start, you know, head down into uh, more, you know, normal Norwegian sort of uh, territory. And this is a tunnel on the E16. Um, I'll perhaps talk about tunnels if there's time, because um, uh, we've got a on our site we've got a page that shows all the tunnels and um, which ones you can th go through and which you can't. But we'll see if I've got time. I'll talk about that later. And then we got to Vang. And actually, when we got there, it was about, it was late. It was uh, just before nine o'clock. And uh, the woman who uh, owned it came up to uh, out to meet us. She saw us coming down the, the sort of driveway. And she said, oh, you'll be wanting a cabot tonight, she said, uh, because she could see the <laughs> the, the dark clouds. And uh, we thought, yeah, OK, we'll have, a, we'll have a cabin rather than put the tent. I'm glad we did. It absolutely threw it down that night. Absolutely threw it down. Um, but these little huts, you can rent them just for a night. Uh, they're a little bit more, well, a bit more expensive than camping, um, but they are reasonably cosy. Um, as Frank with, it's just a little tear and table and chairs. This one was slightly different to some I've been in before. This actually, uh, instead of bunk beds, uh, it had a pull out um, like sofa bed, which is actually more comfortable for us. Whatever. Okay. Uh, all along the Montfagan, you can look out for these little um, signs which tell you a little bit more about the route, a little bit of history, uh, and as you can see, there's bits in English for you. So look out for those. Um, I was saying about the variation, how we doing for time? Yeah, well, I think we're okay. Um, if I get my pointer, this is coming out of the Slatisfell uh, Felliet, and as you come down, uh, from that you can go one of two ways and the, i think they're both on the sign posted uh we came this way which actually does take you down uh along the e16 but there wasn't a lot of um traffic on it uh and we actually wanted to go to vang because there's a campsite there and also want to see the vang stain uh and then from that we came over this way to norris and then or as you see the alternative is to come this way to rifus and that's along a um a more minor road that's tar tarmac road and then you come up uh, a gravel road here this little bit through here you'll see is a little bit rough um so some people may want to go that way there is um a campsite down here there's a campsite over there there's a shop there and a shop there um so either way it doesn't really matter which way you go there's the Vangstein. Um, it's an ancient uh, Viking runic stone, which, and it's got an inscri inscription on it, uh, which I, I can't remember exactly. And uh, they like their cows. A lovely little cartoon on the side of a building. So that was rather good. Uh, it was in Vang. And this is us coming out of Vang. Um, that's the E16. It has got a bit of cycle route in there. And that's Grinden, the big mountain in the back there, um, uh, dominates uh, the valley. And then we turned off there and oh yeah, 
it is signposted. So you'll see these sign signs along the way. The only thing is they're not at every junction. Um, so I would advise that you take a map uh, or alternatively, like we did, I uh, downloaded a GPX file. There is a GPX file which you can download off our website, um, uh, which I would say uh, is of the route we took. There are some variations, so you make up which way you want to go, but that might just help. Uh, initially, it was a you know a level little bit of route, but then uh, we started to climb up, and uh, this is a nice uh, view down the Vangs Moisa uh, Valley there. And it started to get a little bit steeper as we're coming up through these birch trees. Lovely route, nice little path, lovely wildfires along the side. Uh, gave us some good views. You've got to find it. That's one of the nice things about cycling and, and particularly in the, finding a nice spot just to sit and have a brew and have something to eat. Very good view. It's good. And, whatever. and this is again near to the top. You can see the sort of height we're starting to get at because there's snow, not quite at our level. There's still a few. Uh, 100 feet to get up to there but you know we're starting to climb a little bit so if we look at the elevation uh we've come up from vang up here and we're just on the top here there's three lakes there's norasinden mitrasinden and then sorasinden um that uh, you pass as you go along and that's uh norasinden a uh, big lake down there and that's me just coming down through this little hamlet to get to it and our experiences of having done quite a lot of tombs in Iceland, where there's a lot of uh, river crossings, is that you always check out the river crossing, um, you know, just to make sure that it's not too fast flowing, that it is, you know, which is this, um, a bit that's not so deep, where the rocks are and things like that. But this is nothing. This is just ankle deep. We just wheeled the bikes through there. In fact, if, you know, mountain bike, you just bike straight through it. But it, always prudent to check out. You just don't know what might be there. And it's somewhere like that, you can have a brew. We do we do a lot of brewing of tea. And uh, we're a bit like um when we were in um, Ladakh in, in the Himalayas and the, the Sherpas there, they um they would sort of their distance was done in how many cups of tea it took. You know, they didn't understand miles or anything like that. Like, oh that's that's three cups of tea, or so that's well, that's only two cups of tea. So I think we're a bit the same. Uh the route from there <laughs> We, we were warned about this by, from our friend Stan and Dama that this particular bit was a bit boggy and whatever. Frank, who says, pushing hers along there. She, she, you know, if you had a mountain bike with big wide tires, you'd probably burn across there. But uh, we did take it a little bit easy. And there were, as you can see, there's um, tractor, uh, tractor tire tracks and they were sort of sunk into the ground. You can see Frank's, you know, was catching the, uh, the sides of the, the ruts. So she elected to, to push a little bit. I think I did as well. Uh, but thankfully, it wasn't uh, too bad. And we've soon back on to uh, easier riding. And uh, as you can see, the gravel road is uh, pretty good. Hardly saw a pothole in any of these, uh, on you know, on the proper ones that were obviously maintained. Hardly saw a pothole at all. Brilliantly maintained. Uh, this is actually the middle... Uh, lake. This is uh, Mitra Sindon, and you can probably just see to uh, the right there some summer houses. Um, but the Norwegians love their summer houses, and you can imagine, you know, lovely evening sitting out there, you know, with the evening sun, with that beautiful view, absolutely cracking. And uh, as I said, the um, uh, route is signed, the old Nukfegen, and there's some other signs. We wonder what this cycle route. We decided we'd, that was the farting cow route. <laughs> I think that's meant to be mud, but it looked more like a, it was a farting cow. As I say, Norwegians love their summer houses. How am I doing? I need to run on a bit here. Um, and there's some boys putting their tires up at our campsite at Sorosinden. Beautiful spot. Lovely evening. Lovely sunset on there. And a beautiful morning. One of the things I love about wild camping is, you know, the evenings and the mornings, you know, and this was, you can see hardly a ripple on the lake. Beautiful still. Somebody's going to ask about midges or mosquitoes. No problem. Didn't have any problem at all. Um, I don't know why that was quite still. If this has been Scotland, that 
tent door would have been zipped up I'd, you know <laughs> wherever I'd have been uh, you know wherever but no didn't really have any problem maybe it's the time of year I don't know but uh, there we go from there we headed down through some beautiful hay meadow meadows uh, and we're now uh, on if you look at the uh, elevation we're just coming down this bit here fairly flattish down to facet uh, there's one little bit where you get off a gravel road and you're on this track it's got a nice little track although there was parts where it was quite rocky uh, if you're on a mountain bike you you, you know wise tiles you probably have no problem at all didn't go on for too long but it uh, went through this sort of nice um heathery uh area lovely again weather was really nice see franks in a t-shirt it's nice and warm more little um uh, hamlets where there's dairy farms coming through hay meadows that one was just being cut lovely smell of uh fresh hay and this uh is where we're coming down to a little river where we crossed over a bridge uh you go down through here over a bridge then there's a little bit of an up and then we went along this way towards facet and we got to this is uh facet vatnet Vatnet is the lake uh it's lovely at this point you turn to the left to go into facet itself it's not as much much there the campsite I can't remember. there's a shop and whatever and we went to a restaurant had quite a nice little meal there and then climbing up from the from Vasset, uh, we had this horrible climb. It was one of those, I don't know whether we'd eat too much for lunch or whatever, but it was a bit boring, you know, this scrub and the view, bump, you know, looking this way, great looking back. Uh, and it just seemed to go on and on. It was a bit of a tough climb. Um, and we were quite glad to get to the uh, Gombo uh, Felstua, and we stopped for a very welcome uh, waffles and coffee with strawberry dam again I think and the chap there was really nice uh, but it was all worth it for the climb because when you get up to this bit the stole the Vida uh, Vida in Norwegian means expanse and basically it's a big open expanse and uh, absolutely cracking lovely skies more wildflowers by the side of you know if you looked for them oh, I think I missed that one big skies big skies uh, on there um what was that program 2000 acres of sky you know some big skies lovely mountain scenes in there up on the uh the Stolz Vida, there are loads of cycling uh trails as you can see going off and all over the place so it could be a nice place just to go up there and cycle around on the trails you know if anybody's that inclined you know uh make up your own little route you don't have to stick to the to the Moltfagen and uh, this is us starting to drop a little bit down now on the, on the far side. Uh, you can see the trees, tree lines. So we're starting to get down into the tree lines. So we've sort of come uh, across this top bit here and we're starting to, to drop down here. As I say, a lovely sort of evening, lovely sky and uh, mountains. Uh, what, can, what more can you ask for? And... Um, we got to this place, which is uh, Tilsleif Le, Jordan Lake. It's actually um, a reservoir. There's a dam you go over here. And uh, uh, that's where we spent the night, um, just close to, to Osset. And there's our camping spot. Um, how are we doing for tonight? Right, I need to crack on. We're nearly there. Uh, a nice little spot. From there, we were on the last leg, which is Osset down to it says go but it should be goal <laughs> the l's disappeared off um along the way uh just off the road is this lovely uh felkirka it's a stave church it looks really old but it was actually built in 1979 by one guy who built it himself did all the carving absolutely lovely on there and i'm uh, moving on a little bit as so i'm conscious of time give time for um questions and answers um we stopped at this restaurant uh at otter stolen um uh we had a reasonable breakfast but we were we just we had the munchies and i went in there and the, the um menu was in norwegian so i asked the woman in my best english uh because <laughs> my norwegian's not very good and i think she was latvian um um so she didn't know any english she knew norwegian and obviously i think it was latvian something like that 
So I sort of pointed to something on the menu and she put her hands up and waggled her figures. So I concluded that was obviously reindeer. So we had a reindeer stew. And it was lovely, really was lovely. And uh, that's the only place that I think may not be a restaurant anymore. I think they've turned that into just accommodation and sort of built some huts around it. I might be wrong about that. Um, but if you go to Norway, you've got to see some trolls and the ubiquitous uh, Norwegian trolls that you usually get lurking about. Well, these are the nice trolls. And from there, we're on our uh, you know way down now. Um, as I say, we were going to see our friends Stan and Dama, who uh, lived in Goal. Um, and uh, so uh, we were sort of heading out. Lovely day, I see. Not even a cloud in the sky. Nice route down. Um, we wanted to see elk. We hadn't seen any uh, further up. We thought, oh, you know, just watch out. We might see some elk on this bit. Nah, they're the only animals we saw on the road. Uh, some sheep, uh, which uh, were quite obstinate. They didn't really want to move, those two. They didn't want to move at all. Okay. And when we got to 51, um, it was a lovely downhill ride um, all the way down it's downhill and there's hairpins and whatever and we just enjoyed the ride down um whatever. and eventually arrived in our uh, the town of goal um to see our friends and just so that you know that there is an alternative to coming down the uh we came uh that's also where we spent the night um we you come across down this bit and you meet the 51 and we went down here lovely route down but if you go in the other way you won't want to go up that road um and you know there's, there's a fair bit of traffic on it and you could come down this way as well but there is an alternative this takes you up the valley and there's sort of a gentle route that then takes you across a more gentle route through uh, so you can avoid the main road uh, if you want to right i'm just gonna i hope this runs okay i didn't make this video this is made by Valdra's, um, you know, the, the, the commune um, people that, uh, you know, run uh, the commune. And it's obviously a sort of an advertising thing. So I hope it runs okay. John, you need to yeah. uh, pause that. Can you see it? We're not getting any sound. You're not getting any sound? Oh. No. Um, uh, hold on. Laura, can you remind John what the setting is to get the sound working? Is there a way of getting the sound? You want yeah, just... there is. You'll have to, if you stop sharing your screen, yep. and then when you click share, yeah. at the bottom left, there's a button that says share audio. Ah, right. Okay. So uh, share sound. Beg your pardon. Yep. Right. Didn't, didn't share that bit. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's make sure I've got the right bit uh da, 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 powerpoint i think that's the one. Oh god it's wanting permissions do apologize for this folks you get the sound All right okay is the sound coming through sounds fine yeah, yeah. Just pull it up a bit Okay, it's only a short film, but it you know gives a little bit of uh, come out of that. So that's really the Milkvegan route. We hope you've enjoyed the talk, and hopefully it might have inspired you to give it a go. Um, I think it's one of the nicest routes, or one one of there's 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 loads of other good routes that we've done the Ralleveg and uh, you know the um, Lafote Niles. There's all sorts of good routes, um, but it's it's a cracking route, um, whatever. 
if you want a little bit more information, see a few more uh, slides, go on to our website, cycletora.co.uk, and there's a bit more on there. So there you go, Steve. I hope people enjoyed it. Uh, Tucson Tack, John. That was that was awesome. Nice I'm, I'll stop sharing. I'm sure that. I speak for. I'm sure I speak for the audience to say I'm feeling pretty, pretty uh, inspired. Are you happy to uh, answer a few questions? John? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, okay. Um, Can you still stir me? Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. Everyone's still there. Cool. Um, the people in the chat are giving a little round of applause and saying thank you as well. So that's, that's good. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm not going to go through all the questions because some of them you answered in the talk, like about the biting insects and stuff. But a couple people were asking about um, actually getting to Norway um, yeah. uh, and whether you bike bags on the flight or what you did about transporting your bike. Uh, okay. Out. Yeah. Well, we flew with uh, Norwegian Air. I see. I see. Uh, seem to remember. Um, in on that particular occasion, we use CTC um, bike bags. Um, we always have this thing about, you know, which way do you go with those? Do you put them in a box? And the trouble is when we've put them in a box, we've actually seen them just get hurled about. You know, they don't think they're a bike. We work on the premise that if you put them in a plastic bag, they can see it's a bike and hopefully they take a bit more care. Um, having said that, we're hoping to go off to New Zealand um, in 2024, uh, but we've actually bought some hard uh, bike boxes to put them in because you think you know they're going that distance you know slide them to be there in one piece i must admit at times we've used a plastic bag we've had very little problems you know that you know they've taken quite good care so that's that's how we did it uh i'll say that's when i've taken bikes to norway that's exactly what we've done as well so we've taken yeah. the ttc bags and it's yeah it's also, it's also quite norwegian airways of yeah they're pretty good they're pretty good um people are asking about the the cost of like food and accommodation and, right, and yeah, stuff and somebody's going to ask you about that um yeah. norway is a bit expensive when it comes to food um to give you an example a pint of milk what we've uh about a pound here one pound fifty um so everything's just probably 25 percent uh, you know more um Accommodation actually is not too bad. Um, I was looking up, you know, the first tour that we stayed in, uh, where we got the um, evening meal, uh, the room, the breakfast, and the lunch. That worked out 105 pounds, which That's I didn't think was too, too bad, considering you know, and it was a nice room, nice shower, chance to um, charge up the phones and everything like that. So, and the other thing I look at it a little bit is that we wild camped. Um, it would have cost us somewhere around about 20, 25 pounds to camp in a normal campsite. Mm -hmm. So if you're wild camping, you're not paying out for that. So that, you know, has a sort of a, an effect on the, you know, on your budget in that you're not spending out, you know, on that. So it swings around about. But if you want to go to somewhere with good scenery and great roads, or, you know, you ha unfortunately have to pay that a little bit more for things. Sure, yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know about you, but I've generally found that the quality, you pay a lot of food, a lot for food in Norway, but you tend to get quite, it, if, it, if you go to a cafe, it's always good. Always, yeah, it's good quality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You get what you pay for. Um, you talked, you did mention the best time of year to go. Can you just remind? Yeah, um, as I say, the technically the milk, the, the, uh, certainly the uh, Jotunheim Wegen is close, is it doesn't open until something like the 20th of June. And I think it closes somewhere at that end of September. Um, so really that's the best time to go is July, August uh, time. Um, mm -hmm. As I say, before that, there's, you know, you could have snow on, 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 the, on those high levels. Um, certainly, you know, if anybody's done the Rallavegan, I've known people in, you know, late July, it's, you know, have, have been wading through snow to finish off the, the Ralevag and, you know, it's a similar sort of thing. So, yeah, that's the best time to go. Uh, I wouldn't advise, you know, going at any other time, really. You could do, you know, it's up to you. Um, but I, I don't think they would stop you going up, obviously, you know, along the road. But um, officially, it's not open until something like the 20th of June. Cool. Uh uh you find some, some of these questions um people were saying um people were asking about uh camping sites and finding accommodation on the route i've actually put a link to the the local 
um, tourism board's website. Yeah, Foundress.com. There's there's a link on our site as well. As mm. I say, there's a lot of um, there's several campsites uh, along the route. Uh, there's one certainly at Vassett. Uh, there's one um, at Old Stappen, if I remember rightly. Uh, mm. One at Beatestolen. One at Vang. One at Rifus. Um, so there there are um, campsites on the route. We took a lot longer than some people would do to do it because we. As I say, we tend to go a bit slow these days and we like to look at the flowers and whatever. You know, you could do it in a lot quicker time than we did. And uh, as I say, people are asking how many days you took. Um, no, you're going to ask me that. Um, funnily enough, you're not going to believe this, but we took 10 days to do that, <laughs> which uh, makes us feel a bit embarrassed. But it, we have this philosophy of just we're there to, you know, take in the flowers, to enjoy ourselves. And well, we don't rush. You can do it in a lot less. You could probably do it, you know, um, in, you know, you could do it in three days if you really wanted to, but you've got to be fairly fit. There's some tough climbing in that and whatever. So I, I'm, again, I'm going to, I'm going to speak for the audience here. There's absolutely uh, no reason to be embarrassed by, by the distance <laughs> of travel because actually that's, that just sounds like luxurious and fun. Which... Yeah. I, I, you know, we've always maintained this it's about you know um it's quite funny one thing i didn't mention is uh, we we do have uh intercoms uh so we can talk to each other because i tend to race up the hills a little bit more than frank does and uh i remember going up that first hill she said you will tell me when i'm enjoying myself won't you <laughs> and uh we have this cycle touring mantra where i am enjoying myself i am enjoying myself there are there are times when yeah you know, you're going up a steep hill and it's just going on and on. Or those times when it's peeing it down with rain and, you know, you think, why am I doing this? You know, but then when you do a route like that in beautiful conditions, you know why you're doing it and why you're there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I absolutely <laughs> agree. It's, it's uh, certainly having toured in Norway a couple of times is some some uh, testing character building stuff. Um, yes, that's right. Okay. A few people have asked about the camping seats that you saw. I presume they were the, the Thermarest seats, or was that? Oh yeah, else? yes, yeah. No, they're not Thermarest. We actually use Xpeds. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, we found we used to use Thermos, uh, Thermarest, but the Xpeds we find uh, are much better. They're a bit deeper. Um, mm -hmm. My wife, uh, you know, I might have mentioned, she has a bit of a back problem, and um, in order to get comfortable, these are about probably give you three or four inches of depth. Um, and they're also down filled, uh, mm -hmm. so that a lot more insulation and you can get this chair kit, as you could see, um, that goes over the top and you just pull a couple of straps and that just makes you a chair. So you, the, as I say, the sleeping mat turns into a chair. They're absolutely brilliant. A little bit extra weight to carry, but when you're getting a bit of an old git like me, <laughs> you need a bit more comfort. <laughs> so so uh, we, we, we think it's worth the weight. Do you, do you know you, you're saying that i i was kind of thinking quite a lot of the time when i've been on cycle tours or expeditions or whatever the thing i miss the most is a seat yes so i think yeah. it is it is and my wife because of her back she can't sit mm. upright for a, uh for any length of time you know and so they're a godsend for her absolute godsend you know worth their weight in gold and that i don't think they're particularly uh cheap but they're worth it <laughs> uh okay there's, there's still quite a few more questions but we're getting off the time so i'm just going to ask one more so apologies yeah. to everyone who's asked questions uh but this is the question that i i want the answer to so that's why i get to ask it um uh how are you doing those terrain profiles on your powerpoint they are oh right um yeah that actually came um off um uh do you know outdoor active uh, it's a, a mapping um, sort of bit like Strava sort of type thing where you can put in uh, a GPX file and it, it pulls out um, these elevations. And mm -hmm. I must admit, I think that's just a quick screen grab um, mm -hmm. on there. And then I annotated it with the red lines on that. Uh, but check it out. The, the nice thing about them is uh, they have uh, OS maps on mm -hmm. um, and you don't, there's, there's no su subscription or anything to them. So that's that's quite good. Not that I have anything to do with them, but uh, it is good. Uh, I'm going to say that if there is any questions uh, that, that haven't been answered, and if anybody wants to contact us um, and ask that question, if they just go on at Cycle Tora, there's a email link, and they can always email it to me, and I'm happy to answer any questions that haven't been answered. If that's okay. Brilliant. Well, um, 
I guess all that's left to say is Tusen Tak yet again, uh, John, okay. for an absolutely wonderful talk. Tusen Tak everyone for coming along to, to watch um, and for getting involved in the chat and asking some, some really great questions. Um, another brilliant talk. There are, I don't know, maybe 600 more talks to go on the Cycle Touring Festival this year. I don't know. I've, I've lost count, but uh, every single one of them looks brilliant. So um, spend every night this week listening to people talk about amazing things that you can do on the bike. Um, Cycle Touring Festival. Dot, I don't even know what the website is. I'm not going to try. Uh, please do remember to donate if you can. If you can't, don't worry about it. It's free. It's great. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. And we'll see you all again next time. Yeah, and thanks everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye, everyone, and thank you very much. Yeah.